Now, before we see this first slide this morning, it's a, it's a test. Zach mentioned tests uh, in school, finals, whatever. So, I'm going to ask you a question. Am I on the microphone here? There I am. Okay. Everybody hear me okay? Now, the question is this. What is church? Now, before you say anything, I'm going to show you a slide. It's got four pictures. One, two, three, four. And if you know what church is, I want you to raise your hand. I will call upon you. Okay. And, uh, and, and I'll see if you've got the right number. Okay, so John, show us that first slide. All right. So, uh, we want to ask ourselves, what, what number picture is a church? If you know, raise your hand. All right, Rihanna. Number two. Number two. Okay. Everybody agree with that? Cardell. All of them. No. Wrong answer. But I love you anyway. Anybody else got what other number? Any other number? Yes, ma'am. One, two, No. Wrong. But I love you anyway. Okay. One. No. But I love you anyway. Okay. No. But I love you anyway. You want a second chance, Cordell? Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's not a trick question. He's used to his All right, Shelby. Two and, two and three. Now, why do you say two and three? Because it's got people in it. People. Now, here's the deal. We are propagandized to think of church being a building. Church is not a building. It's people. And so two and three show people. Now they may be in a church building, Cordell, but it's not a church. You can have a church building by having a church. You can have a church by having a church building. Okay? So I want us to get the mindset that church is the people of Christ that Christ is called out, okay? Whether they're meeting in a four million dollar edifice or they're meeting in a, 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 a mud floor hut in Africa, okay? Whether it's two together or four together or five thousand together. So it's people that are called out by God. So one in four are church buildings. This is a massive building. That kind of looks like Severance Valley. It didn't like a church. It was like a school. Okay? That looks more like a traditional church there. So these are church buildings where hopefully people come to worship and the church would come into there. But no, we know that two and three are churches because they are people. Okay, so, what is the church? It's the people called by Christ to gather together to worship Him. Now, there's a universal church, a local church. Local church is like we are. A local body of believers, baptized in the Lord, that come together to worship Him. Universal church means that worldwide there are people who know Christ, who are baptized in Christ. Maybe different denominations, but we all belong to Christ, so our faith in Him. And that's the, the worldwide church. And then you have the local church, okay? Now, body of Christ. We hear that a lot in Scripture, talk about it a lot in Scripture, but what does it mean? The body of Christ means those who have faith in Jesus are drawn by Him into salvation, baptized both spiritually by conversion and biblically by physical water, they're part of the body of Christ. Now the church is called the body of Christ and so it means that all these different parts of his body make up different parts. Look at ourselves today. We are different parts of the same body. Every member makes a part of the body. A body needs to have two feet, two arms, two eyes, etc. to function. We make up the functionality of the church. And if someone is not functioning correctly, the body's impaired. Okay? If something happens where I'm not doing my part to be a church member, I impair the body. Now, we need to get that today. We don't breeze in here just to say, hey, I show up at church, woo, and God happy. Well, he's happy to show up at church, but listen, it's more than that. I have responsibility to be a believer, a disciple in the local body, and to use my talent, gifts, and, and, and money. You know, why do we worry about money? It takes money for everything. You, you pay your bills by faith? Well, you should pay them by faith. Let me tell you what. If you don't pay your bill, your water gets cut off. So we need to make sure God's house has what we need as far as our support and resources. Now, 
Romans 12, 4 and 5. Just, for just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one another. So, the church is one body. Kids, y'all can draw a body there. Y'all, most of y'all have done that. Draw a body there. Who's the head of the church? Christ. He's the head. We are part of his body. And we have a functionality to do. Now, every part of the human body is important. Whether you're a cell, a fingernail, an arm, what, every part of the body is important. Well, every part of Christ's body in the church is important. So, we're all members in one body. Everybody got that? So, when you come to Christ by faith, you become part of His body. Okay? Now, when you become part of His body, you don't breathe on your own. You don't breathe on your own. You breathe through Him. You live through Him. You eat through Him. You receive nourishment through Him. We're on the life support of Jesus. Think about it that way. How long can you live without Christ? You can't. So, you see somebody in the hospital on a, breath, on a, on a, uh, a breathing apparatus, and they're being helped with their lungs having air pumped in them. They're only alive because of that uh, machine that helps them breathe. We only are alive spiritually because Christ helps us breathe. And the moment someone understands this, without Jesus Christ, you're no longer breathing. Without Jesus Christ, you're no longer living. Ephesians says, you were once lost in your sin, He quickens you, made you alive in Him. So there's no real life apart from Christ. That's why you can't have consistency. That's why you can't have the peace of God. Unless we have the consistency of life in Christ, in His body, we don't, are not receiving what He wants us to have. Okay? Now, key word, ecclesia. That's the Greek word for church. Ecclesia. E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. -E that's a transliteration in English. Ecclesia means those who are anywhere, those who anywhere in a city, village, constitute such a company and are unified in one body. Ecclesia means we're called out from the world, separated from the world, and placed in Him. Hagios is the word means holy. I want you to get this. If you belong to a church, you are the Ecclesia, you're the true church of God through Christ. You're called from death into life, from ungodliness to godliness, from unholy to hagios holy. So therefore, if I'm part of the body of Christ, I have to make a difference in Christ. I have to live a certain way, think a certain way, talk a certain way. How many don't do that? They go out here on the street corner, they tell a dirty joke, they cuss, they carry on. Well, that's not representing the church of Christ. That's why the church has so many folks that say, well, a bunch of hypocrites over there, because what they see out in the world is not what a difference should be. And we think it's okay because how many folks think because they're saved, they knew what they want to? Well, I'm saved, so I can, I can do what I want to because I'm going to heaven anyway. Maybe not. You say, what do you mean? If you're really born again and saved, you won't do those things. You don't want to do those things, Right? Now, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, but the point is that when you're called by God, you get saved. Let's go back to being saved. When you get saved, you're snatched from death, put in life, snatched from the holiness to be holy, and you're up. Behold, if anyone be in Christ, they're a new creature. Hold all the old things pass away, all things come new. Now, do you make mistakes? Sure. But you understand you made a mistake. You're sorry for it. You repent of that sin to walk in the news of Christ. So, if you're a church, it's more than a building. It's more than a fellowship. More than a potluck. It's more than saying, I go to so-and-so church. I love to ask some people this. They say, well, yeah, I go to church. I always ask folks, you go to church? Yeah. Where do you go to church? Well, I go to so-and-so church. Who's your pastor? Uh, if you don't know who your pastor is, you don't go to church. Don't tell me you go to church and don't know your pastor. I got a better question. Who's your Lord? See, we're, we're fooling ourselves in this country thinking that we're a Christian nation. We're not. We're, not, we're a remnant nation. Every country's had a remnant. And that remnant helps us shine the glory of God in spite of ourselves many times. Now, 
1 Thessalonians 2 4. For you, brethren, brothers, became, now get this, imitators of churches of God in Christ Jesus. Now, this verse proves that church is people. You ready? For you, brothers, became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endure the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. So, what Paul is saying here is, people make up churches. Born again people make up churches. And he's saying, you have become imitators of the church of God in, in Judea, because you're also suffering. Now, why does the church suffer? Anybody want to answer that? Why does the church suffer? Why does the true church of Jesus suffer? We all know that right off the spot. You know why? Because when you serve Jesus Christ in a real biblical way, you're going to see persecution. You know why we don't get persecuted? Because we don't really go after it in culture. We don't really take a stand in the school, in the marketplace. Now, I don't mean obnoxiously. I'm talking about tactfully, lovingly, ministering to people, helping people. Because we're afraid. We are afraid to be what Christ wants us to be because we're told not to be. Now, listen to me on this. You think Jesus would ever tell you not to be light? Who would tell you that? Who would, who would tell you not to be light? Not to be glory for God. Who would tell you that? Well, Satan. You say, well, do you think Satan speaks to you? Well, he speaks to me. I guess he speaks to you too. Hope I'm not the only one. Satan tells us to shut up and sit down. Now, I love the public school. I'm a public school guy. Okay? I'm also a Christian school guy. I'm a school guy. Education is power. I'm serious. Education is power. We have functioning illiterates in school who are going to be handling high-tech machinery, weapons, all kinds of stuff. Listen, we've got to wake up and smarten up, and we need to get people back to learning and applying the truth. And if some kid doesn't get it, they'll be retained. Nowadays, you pass anybody to get rid of them. But we're producing functioning illiterates that are going to be our culture people, our community people. So, you want your child to be educated correctly in the things that we need to understand. Education is power. I tell kids all the time. Education is power. What used to be a high school degree to do well in life is now a college degree. Or at least some kind of technical training. And so, those that are going to make a difference in the world be separated sheep and goats, so to speak. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. People that have some type of expert technical knowledge and education are going to do better. So you've got to learn. You've got to study. Now the church. Do you know we have so many functioning idiots in the church? You know what? Because we haven't taught them. We have, we, ignorance is nothing wrong. It means lack of knowledge. Whose responsibility is to teach you? Don't you say me. It's your responsibility to teach you. Through reading the Bible, learning the Bible, letting the Holy Spirit teach you. Now, I assist in that effort. But you can't have functioning illiterate people in church because if we don't teach the Word of God, that's what you become. Not because you want to be, but we've left people out there blowing the wind. That's why they're church hoppers. Church hopping is not a biblical term. Write that down somewhere. You don't church hop. You follow the Holy Spirit and you unite with the church because Christ leads you there and you leave that church when the Holy Spirit leaves you to lead. Not because you get mad at the preacher. I guarantee you, at some point in your life, you'll get mad at the preacher. You'll get mad at me. As wonderful as I am, you'll get mad at me. If you get mad, call me. I won't answer the phone, but call me. And I'll pray for you. What I'm saying is, I know folks that leave churches every week. Because of what they want. Wrong perspective. It's what he wants. Amen. And so, what I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm saying, we have a responsibility to teach the Word of God. In children, in youth, adults, and we're doing that. 
But how many people do you know that say they're a Christian in a church and been there for years that couldn't tell you between Barabbas and Barnabas? Am I right? Yeah. You know why? Because we've been worship people only and we haven't been learners of the word. What did Christ say? Make worshipers. No. Make disciples. A disciple bears fruit of the teacher. Okay? So a church is a body of Christ made up of believers, of disciples that produce. How many industries in America I saw on Twitter this morning how many warehouses how many factories are just laid to ruin run down nothing happens there anymore in America manufacturing is not there everybody knows that right we see that well, how many churches are the same way they may have people there they're no longer producing anything I love that story about the guy in the military in Washington D.C. He attended a church that was on fire for Jesus. He got sent somewhere else over the years and finally got restationed back to D.C. He went back to that same church, big sign on the door, went out of business, closed, went out of business, forgot what our business was. What is our business? Our business is to come in and learn here to go and share there. It is not to come here and graze at the Christian buffet. Our buffet for you proper people. Is to come in here and get the Word of God and go out there and share it. Because you got people in Radcliffe, in E-Town, Fort Knox, Rhineville, all over without Christ going to hell. And our main imperative should be to tell folks about Jesus. If we don't have that, let's close the door, go home, and watch TV or fish. How can a church expect to be glorifying the Lord if we're not sharing the Lord? And why do we want His blessings if we're not talking about Him the right way? It's just like people. They want the blessing without the effort. Now, key words. Saved. People say, well, that's an old-fashioned word. I don't care if it's old-fashioned or not. It still works. If you're saved, you know you're saved. Saved what? Saved from hell? Saved for heaven? Saved from sin? He plucked you out of the fiery pit? He, he helped you become a born-again child of God? On the cross, He died for your sin? Jesus Christ saved us. I'm glad to be saved. How about you? Well, isn't that special? How many are glad to be saved? Amen. How many are really glad you're not going to hell? Amen. I'm so relieved. You say, why are you being mean to us? I'm not. I'm trying to tell us something. we got to have passion. We yell and scream for everything in life. We need to be passionate about Jesus. Because He's certainly passionate for us. Okay? Now, how about the word baptized? Now, the 12th of June... We're going to baptize some folks. Hey, right, Stella. Yes, We're going to fill that baptistry up there in the parking lot. We're thinking about having a combination of baptism and car wash. I'm not sure how it's going to work out yet, but you know. <laughs> a little fundraiser for the youth, okay? No, way, no need to waste water. No, but I'm saying it's going to be a glorious day. We're going to baptize Stella, maybe some other people that haven't been baptized. Hey, now, baptism, no, we already baptized you, buddy. I won't forget that because we almost didn't get you under. <laughs> you fought like a duck in tar. I mean, you, you, you fought us. You fought me and your daddy. And you know what, buddy? You are strong. He wanted in, though. I know, but it's good, though. Yes. Carter got saved and baptized. That's wonderful. He's one of God's special people. It's like y'all are. Yeah. So, if we're going to baptize that Sunday morning. We're going to have a lot of things, especially this summer. We're going to have a couple of cookouts in the parking lot and combine it with church. You say, why? What am I going to do that for? Because people come to cookout. They come to, they come to a party. They come to a picnic. You know that Jesus Christ spent a lot of time teaching around the meal table? Yeah. With me? So we're going to have some fun this summer. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, starting today, you can wear shorts all summer. I'm going to have mine on sometimes. Bird legs and all. Huh? Well, you don't have to. Hey, it's not an ordinance. You don't have to wear shorts, okay? It's, it's, it's optional if you want to. Yeah. By the way, excuse me for a second. I don't want to forget this. No, no. My wife said to me, because we're talking about the, the pants, you know, I'm talking about the pants you have that you offer, you know, the sales. Leggings? Yeah, le leggings, sorry. Pants. Pants. Yeah. Huh? She said, talk to Heather and find out what Heather thinks she would like. Oh, I'm supposed to get a couple of them. 
I'm going to get a pair too and be a wrestler. All right. Yeah. I have a picture of Jeremy in one of our shirts. <laughs> really? Uh-huh. In that special. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's good, Jeremy. It's a guy yeah. shirt. It's a guy shirt. Yeah. Well, here's the deal, guys. I, I, believe, I believe in the body of Christ being one and being transparent like your family, okay? We're all part of a family, okay? We love each other. We cry together. We help each other. Okay, now... That word saved means you're saved in Christ. Baptized means after, after you're saved, you get baptized. Bad is not part of your salvation. It's part of your discipleship. So once you get saved, you're baptized, okay? And baptism is by being immersed in water. Okay, thirdly, obedient. That's yeah, misspelled. Wrong. <laughs> obedient. <laughs> not grammatically. Don't look at that. Not grammatically. <laughs> Just listen to my voice. Don't read my words. Obedient. Obedient. That's the key word. Obedient. People have problems with obedience. They do. You tell people, please do this. Why? Why? Well, number one reason I said so. <laughs> number two, you work here. Number three, you get paid here. Number four, you should want to. School? Obedience. Work obedience. Life obedience. Obedience is a functionality of life. You can't live life properly unless you're obedient. Amen. Obedience means a right response to authority. Okay? So that's part of being in church too. How about service? We are saved to serve. Now, won't you hear me on this one? Every single person in this church is called to serve. Various different gifts and talents. You're all called to serve. Retha makes our baby blankets. That's a great place of service. That's something she can do. She's taking her talent and gifts. And, and, and she's sewing. That's wonderful, okay? That's an example of everyone has a gift or talent they can use the glory of God, okay? So this idea that we have levels of service, like here's the upper echelons, no. Amen. We're all on the same level. The pastor's not here, and I'm down here. No, we're all on the same level. It's different functionalities. Called different things, okay? All right. Now, how about called, recalled by God to be saved and called out, okay? So these are some of the words that churches do. Now, I want you to think about Matthew 16 for a minute. Matthew 16 is a story of Jesus Christ and the disciples in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is the northern part of Israel. Northern part. Now, when I say Israel and Judea, at this time it's all the same place, the Middle East. Northern part of Israel. People are trying to figure out who Jesus is. People that he's speaking to, preaching to, healing, different elements, they're trying to figure out who Jesus is, okay? And that's still the question today, who Christ is. Now, if you think that Jesus Christ is a religious teacher... <coughs> And you have them on the same level as Buddha, Muhammad, Joseph Smith. They all call themselves prophets. Only one difference. Only Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, if you can't get that, you're going to have a real problem in the 21st century. Because our problem today is that pluralism says, hey, we're all going to the same God, no matter which way you go. It does matter. John 14, 6. Christ said, I'm the only way, the only truth in my life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, Christ is teaching the disciples when Jesus came in the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, that phrase, Son of Man, Son of Man remember, always refers to his humanity. Christ always used that to emphasize his humanity. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Disciples, who's he saying? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. Who do people say that I am? And, G and they answered, well, here's some various comments from the people. Then Christ narrows the scope. Who do you say that I am? That's what you got to answer. What I got to answer. Who do I say Jesus is? You say, what do you mean? Well, I not only say who Jesus is by what I say verbally. I say who Jesus is by how I live my life. Where I spend my time. What I think about and talk about and deal with. How I conduct myself in my job every day. 
By the way, where you work will say more about Jesus than anything else you do and how you live your life. If you're out there on the job and you're like everybody else, you don't think about the Lord, you don't take time for devotion time, prayer time, uh, watch what you say and how you say it. You don't have to just cuss. You can say things that just, just are off the wall that folks will look at you like, what's wrong with that person? So on the job where you work will say more about your Christian life than anything else you do. Okay? Now, but what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? See, Christ begins by who do people say that I am. Then he narrows the focus on who do you say I am. Who do you say? When you're on your job tomorrow, who do you say Christ is? When you're at home today, who do you say Jesus is? When you're in the quiet time and nobody knows what you're doing except you and God, who do you say Christ is? Well, Simon Peter, bless his heart, he finally broke through on this one. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son John. Now, hold on a minute. Where's Peter at? Well, that's Peter. Peter's name was not Peter. That was his nickname that Jesus gave him. Peter was the Greek word Petros, which means rock. And this is where he got his name from. Now, listen to what he says. He was Simon, son of Jonah, or son, son of John, or Jonah. For this was not received to you by man, but my Father in heaven. He says, Simon Peter, you had a breakthrough. This is a spiritual enlightenment from God. And Simon Peter says, what did he say? You are the Christ. Now, Christ is not his last name. That's his title. In the Bible it says Jesus of Nazareth. You're always classified by where you're from. But in this case, Jesus Christ, in our Bibles, the article's left out. In the original Greek, it says, Jesus of Christos, which means Jesus the Christ. Christ becomes his title, which means Messiah. Jesus the Messiah. So Peter is saying, well, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. He says, God has given you the understanding of that. And then he goes on to say, And I also say to you that you are Peter. Now see, after that he says, Now you're Peter. And on this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Peter is not what the church is built upon. The church is not built upon any man. The church is built upon Jesus. But here's what it means in the text. Peter, on that type of faith, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Now, that has to do with meaning also. It means that not only will the world not overcome you, but you're going to overcome death. In your life in Christ, you're not going to hell. Somebody say amen. amen. See, we forgot about hell. We forgot about hell in the church. Nobody talks about it. Nobody preaches about it. Why do you think it's so important to be saved? Saved from what? Saved from eternity being separated from God. Do you know what's the most terrifying experience you can have? When you die without Christ and you enter eternity without Him. You talk about in bad shape. You're in bad shape forever. Eternity. Forever and a day. Now, why be faithful in the church? I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. Through your local church you receive instruction. And he first he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training. My job is to train you for the training of the saints, the work of ministry. We all call to work to build the body of Christ so we all reach unity of the faith in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Ephesians 4, 11-15. So, why do we go to church? Why are we in the body of Christ? That we can be instructed in how to live our lives. Number two, through your local church you have privilege of fellowship. It's a privilege to fellowship here. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us not be concerned about one another in order to promote love. And let us be concerned, be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but encourage each other and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Disciples belong to a church. 
disciples worship with the body of Christ. This bunch of stuff that says, well, I belong to so-and-so church, but I don't go. You don't belong to that church. You may be on a roll somewhere, but you don't really belong to that church. You don't give. You don't serve. I'm tired of that bull. People all the time think because they're on a church roll somewhere, they're in good shape. No. Are you on heaven's roll? That's more important than church roll. If you're not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, it doesn't matter. But if you are a child of God, your life should match up with it. It's time we call a spade a spade. Amen. If it looks like a duck and sounds like a duck and swims like a duck, it's probably a duck. Amen. But somebody that lives like hell here in the world and says they belong to so-and-so church, I don't buy it, don't believe it. That could be backslidden. They not only could be backslidden, they are backslidden. If you are a church member, I believe that means certain qualifications go with that. You're actually involved, you're serving, you're seeking, and you come regularly. Let me give you an unbiblical word. Inactive member. Non-resident member. Those terms we have in churches. Folks who on the road don't come. This is wrong. People move somewhere, they move everything except their letter. We're not fooling God. Now you say, well, pastor, you know that... I'm not talking just to us. I'm talking about the problems we have in churches. At Mill Creek Baptist Church, we had 2,000 people on the roll, and I couldn't have found th more than 300 if I had to. Something wrong with that. And that's the way most of our churches are. Something wrong with that. So, I believe in keeping the roll clean and neat. If you're not coming, you're going to be taken off. If you're not coming without some legitimate reason, you're sick, invalid, whatever, we're not going to just keep baggage, I'm sorry, baggage on the roll because you want to be. That's not what the Bible says. Y'all be productive, okay? What do you do with dead wood, the Bible says? What do you do with a dead tree? You cut off throwing the fire. Why? Because it's not being productive, okay? By the way, sometimes you got to prune those limbs, don't you? We all need pruning sometimes, don't we? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, Thirdly, through your local church, you meet to, to worship. Through your local church, you meet to worship. Let the message about the Messiah dwell richly among you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, and singing praises and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude. When our praise team leads us, we sing with gratitude of thanking Christ for what He's done for us. And whatever you do in word and in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. People that talk about their church make me sick. People that talk about their preacher in a less than positive way make me sick. Because they ain't got enough guts to go and tell the right person. People that aren't happy ought to go talk to their pastor. And talk to, talk to him about it. And guess what? Work it out. How many times somebody get mad at church, never say a word to anybody, never tells anybody, they just stay there in a stew for weeks and weeks and months and months, then they just leave. That's not biblical. First of all, you shouldn't stew about anything. Talk about it, pray about it, work things out. Is that what you do with your family? You got a problem, just walk out? Hopefully not. So we need to understand that we meet to worship and then, fourthly, through your local church, you have opportunity for service. According to the grace given us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the standard of one's faith. If service, in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity, leading with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. Now, let me say this as I close today. If I was going to join the Moose Club, or the Elks Club, or be a Rotarian, or like I used to be in the Lions Club, they would expect me to be a certain way. They would expect me to do certain duties, to obey the rules, they're part of that club. Right? Anybody here, one of those members? And, and that's Optimus Club. All good things, I guess. I enjoy being a lion, you know. 
We raise money for, for crippled children, etc. Many of y'all are involved with other organizations that do good things. The point I'm making is if we're involved with those organizations, they would expect us to be an elk, to be a moose, to be part of uh, Cozair. And if we didn't do those things, they'd have no problem at all saying, bye. Right? Why is the church so lackadaisical about that? Why do we expect so little? Why do we say, well, we want you to join so badly, we don't care what you do? Well, I got news for you. We do care what you do. And if we don't have a line of saying to you, God loves you, God saves you, now here's some place of service you can serve, and we expect you to serve. If we don't do that, we're misleading you what the Bible says. And we're causing you and your family to miss a blessing. Because you're not serving like God wants to. It's a loving thing. The point I'm making is, we shouldn't be on a church roll just to be there. That, that grants you nothing. Now, therefore, what did Christ say in Matthew 28, 19? Therefore, go and make disciples of all... That's the key word. Make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, why do we make disciples? Because we're trying to grow those in the body. By the way, when you get saved, you no longer belong to yourself. That's the problem. We think that even though we're a Christian, we can do whatever we want to do. We get freedom and salvation mixed up. We're not free to live like we want to. We're free to live like Christ wants us to. Big difference, okay? Now, this command involves these things. Sharing, the eternal world eternal life with the world, that's sharing, baptizing new believers, teaching the Bible, the joy of ministry in Christ's name, and giving your money, time, and talents for the Lord's work. One day, in the future, we're all going to stand for the Lord. And Christ knows about every millisecond of our life. And if we've asked for forgiveness, that sin's forgiven and forgotten. Never brought up again. But, but here's, here's something we forget about. The little phraseology Christ says He'll say to us as He sees us in heaven, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Now, let me ask you a question. Can Christ lie? Would Christ lie? So you could enter heaven being saved, but if you haven't lived a life that's full of service, He's not going to say to you, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You're going to come into heaven by the grace of God only because of what Christ has done for you and not anything about what you've done. And what you're going to miss out on is the reward of those blessings of service. Christ's going to give you a crown in heaven, the Bible says in Revelation, in 1 Corinthians. You get a crown in heaven. And, and when you go to that judgment seat of rewards, those rewards that are trying the fire, He's going to give you a jewel to put in your crown. Now, He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His people will serve with Him in the royal family of God. So we have a crown that brings honor to the king. And that crown we have is full of gems that represent our service and rewards on earth. But I believe, based on the word of God, there's going to be some believers. They'll get that crown. It'll be empty. Because they didn't do anything to serve the Lord. I don't know about you. Because the Bible says my ultimate act of worship in heaven is to toss that crown at the feet of Jesus. When I throw that crown at his feet, I don't want it to sound like tin across that street of gold. I want my crown full of stars and full of jewels to represent how I want to honor him. It's not about honoring me or honoring you. It's about honoring him. What does his death for me mean? 
What does his salvation for me mean? And out there when we're in front of people and fellow workers and neighbors and friends, we all have problems with this sometimes. We all fall short. But it's, it's really standing in love and sharing with the world that Jesus Christ is my King. Not because of pride or foolish glory. Just out of humility of saying, Jesus died for me. If the world sees our humility, if the world sees our genuine faith, if the world sees our love, they'll be drawn to it. They'll be drawn to it. And the reason people are not getting saved today, the church is not putting forth the majesty of Christ. It is not about the church building. It's about the church of people. And when the people represent Jesus, that's what really matters. Going to church is more than Ephesus. It is more than Oedipus. It's more than a chapel. It's people called out by God, serving Him out of love and grace.